inflammatory bowel disease. It is a chronic, non-specific inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract or the digestive tract. It takes a path which is described as protracted, relapsing, remitting. What does it mean protracted? It means it takes longer than expected or longer than an average. So, IBD is a long-lasting in time and in the intensity of its severity. Relapsing remitting means the presentation of the disease become worse over time. So it is relapsing, it is coming back, but it is worse, followed by a period of less severe symptoms, but it is not completely cured. It is still, there is some inflammation there. And so it is called remitting. In inflammatory bowel disease, I will call it IBD as an acronym. I from the inflammatory, B from the bowel, D from the word disease. So IBD is a complex disorder consisting of at least 100 clinical conditions. Why? Because it is dynamic. It change over time. And it work on a continuum or on a scale or on a spectrum between two points. A spectrum is a word which was first introduced in physics to describe the optic in physics, meaning the light. They noticed that when the visible light or the sunlight passes through the prism, it will produce a rainbow of colors or when the sunlight passes through the rain or a water droplet, it will produce a rainbow because the light, it will refract. So IBD, it is like a rainbow. It is multicolored. Because it has many clinical presentation over time. IBD could be described as a prototype of a new world disorder. This means no order. And a prototype means that there is a model of something and from which other models are developed. So the first model is copied by others and another model is developed. And why I say that? Because IBD increased in prevalence and in incidence in westernized, industrialized, urbanized countries. Westernized mean in the West. Industrialized mean there is industry. Urbanized mean cities. Because the incidence is higher in the urban 
places, meaning the cities, it is more than in the country. And in the country which have industry. Because the disease increase in number since about 50 years ago and also from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And it is now some people consider it as an epidemic of the New World Disorder. What is a prevalence? Prevalence is the number of patients with IBD at a given time, in a specific time, at a point in time, in a particular population. So, prevalence means the total number of patients with IBD, whether in the past or now. And prevalence, there are two types. There is a prevalence in point, at a specific point, or prevalence over a period of time. Incidence is the number of new cases of IBD which develop over a period of time. For example, the incidence of IBD is measured in Canada in 2018. Then they expect how many cases will be developed in 2030, so in 10 years' time. Or, for example, now we have the epidemic of COVID-19. What are the new cases in a week time or in a month time? And this is the incidence of COVID-19. IBD, there are 240 genes variant, meaning they have SNPs. SNPs mean change in an amino acid in the genes. Some people think 160. And that is why we have so many clinical conditions of IBD if we decide on a clinical signs and symptoms and the presentation of the patient. And if we depend on the genetic determination or determinant for the disease, we will have so many. One, he said, perhaps two to the power of 150. Of course, some of these genes, they are shared between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and they are not specific for each disease. But the genes in IBD are not the cause. The cause is the environment. The environment is the epigenetic meaning epi mean above the gene. The epigenetic result in the alteration and dysregulation of the composition of the intestinal microbiome. So the microbiome it becomes dysbiosis meaning out of balance. And it is not only it become less diverse, less types of bacteria in the gut, but the most important thing is the function of the microbiome. It is not who they are, it is what they do, what is their function, what is the 
molecule, molecule they produce and what are the specific microbial metabolites are produced so the function it is very important in regulating the gut mucosal immune response so so the environment act on the microbiome and then the, the microbiome will result in the dysregulation of the gut mucosal immune response and this happen in a genetically predisposed patient so all these four factors the environment which could be the westernized lifestyle westernized diet the main important factor in the environment is the food we eat the gut microbiome the immune response of the intestine become dysregulated and the genetically predisposed patient all these four they have to come together to produce such difficult disease which is called inflammatory bowel disease now in therapy they decided to not like before to treat the symptoms this is the change now which i am going to say it from the beginning they want to heal to target so the end point in a clinical management of the patient with ibd is to heal the mucosa traditionally they used to treat the symptoms but they found that if they control the symptoms the patient especially with the crohn disease they continue to have some disease activity in the digestive tract in the absence of the clinical manifestation and this led why because now there is recent advances in optical and digital enhancement available for the endoscope so they can use also a follow up endoscopy as an essential part to recognize the mucosal healing and now even little mucosal changes indicative of persisting inflammation now could be recognized but formally or before we could not see it now the advances in dna sequencing technology led to our understanding of the dynamic nature of the early life gut microbiome and the strong effect of cesarean section early life nutrition formula feeding of babies and not breastfeeding antibiotic which affected the species of our microbiome the diversity of our microbiome and the abundance abundance mean the more abundance of this microbiome meaning great quantity the better and many varieties it is better so it is diversity mean many types many phyla many classes and many a large in amount but in ibd there is dysbiosis meaning imbalance between the good bacteria and the bad bacteria which cause the disease so irrespective of so many clinical presentation 
and so many genes involved in producing IBD, we classify IBD into two phenotypes. And I will add at the end another type, which is called IBD and classified. Why we classify IBD? To help us to understand the disease, to help us in management of the patient, in uh, how to treat the patient, what a new therapy we could use, how could we give a prognosis to the patient about their lives. Phenotypes, meaning it is all observable character or features resulting from the interaction between the genes and the environment. So the gene is the nature and the environment is the nurture. And I hope you know this, nature and nurture. Which one is stronger, the nature or the nurture? So now, the first phenotype is ulcerative colitis. It is a continuous superficial inflammation of the mucosa of the colon. Sometimes it could go deeper into the submucosa. And always ulcerative colitis is in the large intestine. Always. But the most common site of ulcerative colitis in the large intestine is the rectum. So it is called proctitis. Proctitis in Latin means rectum. And the incidence is 40 to 50%. Ulcerative colitis, as we said, it is a superficial lesion and it is a continuous lesion. It extends proximally upward toward the sigmoid. And as we said, the rectum and the sigmoid, it will be 40 to 50% of the cases. It is the most common site. And there is Montreal classification of IBD. And in ulcerative colitis, they divide it according to the extent or which part of the colon is affected. So they divide it into ulcerative colitis, ulcerative proctitis, which is distal to the rectosigmoid, meaning involved in the rectum, then it extends proximally to the sigmoid, which is the S-shaped part of the colon. So ulcerative colitis starts in the distal part of the colon. It extends into the ascend in, in the descending colon on the left side, so it is called left-sided ulcerative colitis. And the descending colon is distal to the splenic flexure. And this happened in 30% of cases. I think I should repeat the large intestine. I repeated in two video before, but I will repeat it now. So the first part of the large intestine is the cecum, which is in the lower right quadrant of the abdomen. Then it ascends up, ascending colon. It turns to the left. And this turn called hepatic flexure because it is near the liver. Transverse colon, then it turned down. And this turn is called splenic flexure because it is near the spleen. And it descend, which is called descending colon on the left side. And this is attached to the sigmoid. And the sigmoid is S-shaped. And the sigmoid is attached to the rectum. And the rectum is attached to the anus. And the anus has two sphincters, the inner anal sphincter and the external anal sphincter. So I repeat it again so that you understand what I'm talking about. 
So the most common site of ulcerative colitis is the rectum. Then it extends to the sigmoid, and this is on the left side, and then upward in the descending colon, also on the left side, and the incidence is 30%. And it is called left-sided ulcerative colitis, and it is distal to the splenic flexure, which is on the left side. Then it extends proximal to the splenic flexure into the transverse colon, and this is called extensive colitis, and it happens in 20% of the cases. But sometimes it extends along the hepatic flexure on the right side, on the ascending colon, and it is called pancolitis. Pan in Latin means all, the colon is involved, and this is severe. So to repeat, ulcerative colitis is a superficial inflammation of the mucosa of the large intestine, and it is a continuous lesion. And if you look at it, it is a swollen and red. Crohn disease, it is called the Crohn because the doctor who discovered it, Burrell, B U L R I L L Crohn, in 1932, his name. So, Crohn, it affects the gut from the mouth to the anus, anywhere. Crohn, it affects the digestive tract from the mouth to the anus. But the most common site is the ileum, which is the distal part of the small intestine. And sometimes it involves the cecum. So you see, Crohn is also in the distal part of the ileum, like ulcerative colitis in the distal part of the colon, which is the rectum and the sigmoid. So Crohn now, it affects the ileum and the cecum in 40% of the cases. But sometimes it affects the colon. And it is called the Crohn colitis, 20% of the cases. And sometimes it affects the small intestine. This is also 40% of the cases. And perianal region around the anus, 10% of cases. Of course, these figures, it depends on the age. It depends on the geography where you study this population. Where do they live? And also the environment in which they live. So these figures, they depend on so many factors. So now we talk about where Crohn disease is from the mouth to the anus, mostly in the distal part of the ileum and the cecum. It could affect the small intestine, 40% of the cases, colon 20%, perianal region 10%. The most important thing is the lesion or the inflammation. It is discontinuous. This means it is not continuous. It is described as a skip lesion, segmental lesion, meaning one segment is inflamed, the adjacent area, it is not inflamed. This is number one. So it is not continuous. It is discontinuous. D-I-S. Discontinuous. And the lesion is deep. The lesion is deep. It is called a transmural, meaning it cross all the thickness of the wall of the bowel. So it is deep. It is not superficial. And it is discontinuous. So it involves the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis externa, the serosa, all the four layers of the wall of the gut. And this inflammation, fibrosis, pus, lead to stenosis. Stenosis means narrowing of the lumen of the gut and also lead to stricture. And this means that the wall of the gut get inflamed, fibrosed, and then lead to narrowing of the gut. 
because part of the wall will be involved. So the inflammation is over space, over part of the wall of the gut. And stenosis is more on the lumen. And this sometimes causes partial or complete intestinal obstruction. And this transmural deep lesion, which the ulcer dig in the mucosa, the submucosa and the muscle layer, lead to the formation of abscess. And what is abscess? It is a collection of pus. And what is pus? Pus mean dead white blood cells which came to fight the infection because the white blood cells are the fighters in the blood against infection. So they become dead and they become white and sometimes yellow and the tissue debris because the tissue is also damaged and there is a fluid also from the blood because when there is inflammation when there is war, there is collateral damage. The tissue are damaged, and this collection will produce abscess, just like the boil when you have on your skin. And this abscess and this inflammation, sometimes it leads to fistula formation. Fistula, to remember it all your life, and don't forget it, as I did from the Royal College of Surgeons. It is a tunnel or it is a canal, or a channel, connecting two cavities. That's it. No more, no less. It's very simple. So, then you can make it up. It could be between one loop of the small intestine and another loop. It could be between the lumen of the small intestine and the abdomen. It could be between one lumen of the small intestine and the colon, anywhere. There is no rule and regulation. In biology, there is no rule. And the only rule in biology is there is no rule. And the other rule in biology, everything is changing. Everything is dynamic. Everything is impermanent. And if Crohn disease is in the rectum, and the rectum, of course, is near the vagina, so the cavity of the rectum will open into the cavity of the vagina, and then we have rectovaginal fistula. And then the women will have feces from the vagina and gas. And this happens. It happens. And in Crohn disease, there is perianal lesion around, peri mean around, anal mean anus, abscess also, and we define abscess, what is it? and fistula, and also I explain what is fistula. So, fistula in Crohn, it happened 54% of the cases, about half, if you want to remember, it is around the anus. It is in the perianal region. 24% it is enteroenteric, as I said, between one small intestine, a loop of one small intestine, and the cavity of the loop of a small intestine. 13% it is enterocolic, meaning the small intestine and the colon. Enter enteric means small intestine. And 9% it is rectosigmoid, between the cavity of the rectum and the cavity of the sigmoid. But nowadays they think, some they think, the incidence is less because of better treatment. But other people, they think, no, it is increased. So, it depends where you are studying the cases. And of course, there are so many classifications for this fistula. But one which I liked is Park classification because he put it in relation to the sphincters. And it is very easy to remember. Number one or A is superficial fistula. Very small. From the lower part of the anus to the skin outside. Around the anus. Two or B, type B, it is intersphincteric 
fistula, meaning inter mean in between the sphincters. A trans sphincteric, which is C or 3, it is across the sphincter. The tunnel of the fistula cut across the sphincter and come out to the skin on the outside, around the anus. Number four, or type D, is supra sphincteric, meaning the tunnel will start above the sphincter and coming down to the skin outside. And number five, or C, it is extra, meaning it is above even of the anus, it goes up even to the rectum and then come down to the perianal region, around the anus. Sometimes, patients in surgery, they present with fistula. So, any patient with a present with fistula, we have to think of a Crohn disease because sometimes they present themselves as fistula years before Crohn disease appears. So we have to think about this. And the people who said the fistula decreased, they said because now we do better treatment, we treat the patient, we treat to target, meaning healing of the mucosa, less scarring. But the people who think that the fistula is increased because of increased incidence of distal colitis, meaning Crohn's disease is becoming more and more to the distal part or the lower part of the colon. And the perianal lesions and fistula, it happen as a continuity of the distal colitis. Distal means the lower part, the last part. And this fistula, if they are superficial, they could heal spontaneously on their own in 50% of the cases. But sometimes they penetrate deep and lead to secondary lesions and they make complex fistula. And in subset of patient, this may result in a gradual destruction of the sphincters and in anal incontinence, meaning that the patient wet themselves with feces. And the patient, after years of suffering, they might require proctectomy. Procto means rectum. Tomy means cutting the rectum. And they live with ileostomy, meaning we bring the ileum to the skin of the abdomen and they pass the feces through the skin into a bag. A Crohn is more associated with complication than ulcerative colitis. Why? Because of its deep penetrating nature across the wall of the digestive tract and because it can strike anywhere between the mouth and the anus. In the perianal region, we could see other lesions, could be skin tag, it could be fissure. Fissure mean like a wound. Hemorrhoids. So, we talk about the phenotypes, the ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease as an introduction. And then I will speak about the IBD and classified. Inflammatory bowel disease and classified. This happened in 10 to 15 percent of the cases of IBD. Why? Because these cases they have a clinical signs and symptoms of a chronic inflammation. They have endoscopic finding, but it's not a classical of either ulcerative colitis or Crohn. They cannot fit. And There is no small bowel involvement. And in these cases, we have to rule out infection, especially C. difficile. IBD, and classified, it happened mostly in children. 
and 80% of these cases, they will be reclassified. Reclassified. Re -e meaning they will be classified into adult ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease when they become adult. But some other people, some other children, they will continue as IBD and classified even when they become adult. And of course, the percentage is different. Some said 35%. Some said 69%. It depends where you do your study. Because these diseases are dynamic. And even the Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, in 4% of the cases, they change in, during lifetime. In 10 years or 20 years' time, we have to reclassify them. They change. Crohn become ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis become a Crohn. So it is very, very changing disease. And this uh, IBD and classified, it is made in Montreal classification of IBD in 2006. Some people before, they call it indeterminate colitis. But indeterminate colitis, it is a name or a term introduced in 1978 by Ashley Price. In patients who have colectomy, meaning the colon is removed. And these are cases that are with very poor prognosis. They have very bad remissions. There is no histology. They have very difficult cases. So in Montreal classification, the term kept for patient with colectomy only. But other group of patient, they call them IBD and classified. Any classified, UN classified. Any classified, mean not, not classified. So, we come now to ulcerative colitis and we will discuss the signs and symptoms. As we said, ulcerative colitis is a superficial continuous inflammation and the colon is red and swollen. And if it is severe, it will lead to ulcers. And also the patient will present themselves with diarrhea, antinismus, meaning the feeling of not emptying, bleeding per rectum, and they have anemia 1 in 5, abdominal pain, tenderness, cramps, muscle spasm, fever, weight loss. Anemia. As we said, one in five could be iron deficiency anemia or it could be vitamin B12 deficiency anemia. And the complication of ulcerative colitis are life-threatening complications. For example, fulminant colitis. Fulminant means deadly, fatal, which cause severe pain, Profuse diarrhea, dehydration, shock, and this patient must be admitted to the hospital for hydration and for a treatment. Because if they are not admitted and treated, they die. And the other complication of ulcerative colitis is colon rupture, toxic mega colon. Mega mean big, the colon dilated. The colon wall, because it is inflamed, because it is toxic, so it dilates and there is no contraction. It's just like paralyzed. The other complication is carcinoma. And there are also complications from the treatment, from the medication, also complications from surgery and death. There are symptoms in the other parts of the body. 
For example, the skin. There is a rash. There is redness, pain in the skin. There is condition which is called erythema nodosum. Erythema means red. Nodosum like nodules, like small tumors. And also pyoderma gangrenosa. Pyo means pus. Derma means skin. Gangrenosa means gangrene. Gangrene means dead. And the tissue infected, it becomes black or deep purple. Always in gangrene, the tissue is black because of the organism attack the tissue. It makes the color black or deep purple in color. And this is the skin will become inflamed and then it will be eaten by the bacteria and there is a war between the bacteria and the body because the body attack the skin cells and then the skin cells will be attacked by the bacteria which is on the skin. So, it is like Autoimmune disease, the body attack the skin cells, the skin cell dead. Then the bacteria come and eat the dead cells, and then there will be dead. And we have pus. So we have pyoderma gangrenosa. Also, ulcerative colitis, the bones are affected, and we have osteoporosis, means the bone will become weak, empty, and there is a high incidence of fractures in cases of ulcerative colitis, the eye will be involved, and there will be conjunctivitis, iritis, uveitis, always itis mean inflammation. And please remember the itis. If you forget everything, remember the itis. Why? Because it means inflammation. And now inflammation is a unifying theory of all diseases, of all chronic inflammatory diseases, everything. Obesity, diabetes type 2, uh, cancer, everything. Autoimmune diseases, everything, there is inflammation. Even in normal healthy people, there is little inflammation around the gut, 24 hours 7, to protect us. But this inflammation is imbalance. So, it is not pathological, it is not sickness, it is healthy. It just to protect the body. So small inflammation is good in balance. And the same with stress. Small stress is good because it makes us alert. It makes us work. But too much stress, no. It's deadly. It's no good. So the main thing in the immune system, if it, it is turned on, there is another system in the body turn it off. But what happened here in autoimmune diseases like IBD, the immune system... It does not turn off. It continues damaging the intestinal wall, the body, everywhere. So the eye is involved. The liver, it becomes a primary sclerosing cholangitis and will lead to liver failure and liver transplant. The bile duct in the liver which carry the bile from the liver to the intestine, they become fibrous. Sclerosing means fibrous, and the liver stop functioning. And if the liver stop function, then the patient will die because the liver is very important for detoxification, for metabolism, for the physiology of the body. So the liver fail, the, the liver cells dead, the liver failure, and then... The patient cannot survive unless we do for them liver transplant. We take a new liver from other patient. In a chronic inflammation, usually the blood coagulation become hyper, increased because of the chronic inflammation. So the blood is also affected, and this leads to thrombosis in the portal vein. Portal vein is the vein which carry the blood from the intestine to the liver. It becomes thrombosed, meaning closed. Stop. The blood can't go through. Thrombosis. Thrombus is just like a clot, closing the vein. 
and also it will affect the mesentery venous thrombosis and this is deadly and it happened in 0.5 to 1% of cases deep vein thrombosis mesenteric venous thrombosis and usually they are not diagnosed immediately they are missed and usually we diagnose them late perhaps sometimes after death this is ulcerative colitis signs and symptoms and complications now Crohn signs and symptoms so we repeat Crohn it is uh, discontinuous skip lesion deep transmural and it present as diarrhea bleeding per rectum if the disease is low for example in the rectum then you have bleeding and mucus also abdominal pain due to stenosis which is narrowing of the lumen of the intestine and stricture formation and abscess and inflammation anemia it happened one in four more than in ulcerative colitis in ulcerative colitis one in five in a Crohn it is one in four there is loss of weight fatigue deficiencies of vitamins deficiencies of minerals minerals like uh, zinc selenium chromium all these will be deficient why because of poor absorption because the intestine is inflamed so there is no absorption in this condition also in a Crohn there is poor sleep there is poor mood sometimes mental not happy because of their condition because it is difficult and there is fever at night and sweating and also in Crohn there is lesion outside the gut in the mouth you could see sores like ulcers the eyes are red in a flame also conjunctivitis a swollen painful joints you know sometimes if we treat IBD the joint pain will disappear even if the patient have the pain for two years once we treat the IBD the joints healed and in this patient also they have sclerosis and the perianal lesions which is inflammation abscess formation and this will be around the anus and around the genitalia around the sex organ genitalia complication of a Crohn intestinal obstruction perforation rupture of the bowel cancer stenosis narrowing of the lumen stricture narrowing of the lumen due to inflammation of the wall over a space of the wall not narrow it is it is the lumen is narrow but the wall over distance it is inflamed and narrowed abscess formation fistula lymph adenopathy lymph adenopathy means the lymph nodes are enlarged granulomas granuloma is very important because it differentiated from ulcerative colitis because it is a small area of inflammation and consists of immune cells mostly macrophages macro mean big phages eat so they are big eaters these big eaters they come and they think that the sub substance it is foreign body so they start to attack it they surround it because they cannot eat it so they surround it this is what they think these macrophages and in the we see in a crown pseudo polyp pseudo mean false not a true polyps why because the cells the lining of the intestine it try to regenerate it try to repair itself but they can't and they repair it in the wrong way and of course the other complication is the perianal lesion the medication risk and complication the risk of surgery and death the main point in uh, Crohn even when we do surgery 60% of the cases they have to do we have to do another surgery so it is not only once in ulcerative colitis is different if we need to remove the colon 
then it is okay. The colon is removed and the patient will get peace of mind. But in uh, Crohn, always there is a recurrence. <clears throat> so now, if I summarize the difference between ulcerative colitis and Crohn disease, if I talk about the incidence, it is almost the same. <clears throat> it is about 2 to 19 per 100,000 in ulcerative colitis, and in Crohn, it is 2.1 to 20 per 100,000. Smoking, it is protective in ulcerative colitis. It is aggravating in Crohn disease. The onset is almost the same. It happened in the young between 15 years old and 40 years old, and some people they think between 13 years old and 40 years old. It is the same, and two-thirds of the cases are below 30 years old. But the interesting thing, now the incidence of both ulcerative colitis and Crohn, it is more common in children, less than 18 years old, and there are cases even five years old and two years old. It's very high incidence in children now. So now, the difference in location, ulcerative colitis is happening in the rectum, which we call proctitis, and in the sigmoid, so it is in the distal colon. Crohn disease, it happened in the distal ileum, which is the last part of the small intestine, and the first part of the colon, which is called the cecum. If we come to the histology, histology means the tissue of the lesion, of the sick area. Lesion means the sick. So in ulcerative colitis, we see superficial inflammation, continuous lesion, starting from distal to proximal, from the lower to the upper. In Crohn disease, it is discontinuous, it is deep, it is Transmural, meaning across all the layers of the intestine or of the colon. Complications in ulcerative colitis, severe bleeding, and this may lead to death. And I remember a case in Edinburgh, this is in the 60s, perhaps in 1967, a 20 years old, young girl, white skin, blonde hair, lying in a glass room, which is isolation room, in the end of the ward, in the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, and she has ulcerative colitis, and her hemoglobin was 5 gram percent, and she was booked for colectomy, meaning excision of the colon. But that young lady, which looked like Cinderella, she was a beautiful thin now, her image is in my brain, uh, she refused to take blood because of her religious belief, and then she had the operation, and next day when we came in the round, they told us she is dead. I remember this case. I never forget her. She was ulcerative colitis, affected with severe bleeding, which caused anemia. She has surgery, but she is dead. 20 years old. So the complication in ulcerative colitis is toxic megacolon, ruptured bowel, cancer of the colon. In uh, Crohn disease, also severe complication, but related, related to stenosis, narrowing of the lumen, stricture, also narrowing of the lumen because of the inflammation of the wall, abscess formation, fistula, which is the canal between the cavity of the intestine and other cavities, colon cancer, perforation. Ulcerative colitis, we said it is superficial inflammation, relapsing or remitting. If it is active inflammation, it will be inflammation and ulceration. If it is inactive, the disease is dead and the cells are atrophied, it's gone. And ulcerative colitis happen only in the large intestine, or what we call is the colon. Crohn disease, 
The disease could happen in the small intestine or the large intestine or anywhere between the anus and the mouth or between the mouth and the anus. And the lesion is a granuloma, which is, as we said, it is collection of immune cells around a foreign body and produced like a nodules. Pseudopolyp, which is false polyp. All layers of the bowel is affected. And Crohn, it is more serious because of more complication and more surgery. And as I said, 60% of the cases we need another surgery after the first surgery. How we diagnose ulcerative colitis and Crohn disease? Full blood count to see white blood cell, to see if there is inflammation. Because if there is inflammation, the white blood cell become higher in number. And to see also if there is anemia, iron deficiency anemia and the hemoglobin is low. And also we do an inflammatory markers, which is C-reactive protein, CRP and ESR. ESR mean erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Erythrocyte mean red blood cells. Erythro in Latin mean red. Site means cell. So it is the red blood cell sedimentation rate. It is a special test. We put the blood in a test tube and see how much it is sedimented, and then we read the number. The higher the number, the more inflammation. And also CRP, the higher the number, the more inflammation. The less the number, the less inflammation. We do liver function test, the enzymes, to see the function of the liver. We do kidney function test to see the kidney. Urea and electrolytes, electrolytes mean the salts in the blood, for example, sodium, potassium, chloride, we check that. And also check the vitamins, for example, vitamin B12, calcium, vitamin K2, omega-3. We do stool examination to see if there is a blood and if there is a protein which indicate inflammation. Why? Because this protein is found in white blood cell. And if white blood cell is in the stool, it means that there is inflammation in the gut. So it indicates inflammation. And this protein is called calproctin. Calproctin. Calproctin in the stool. C-A-L, prot, P-R-O-T, E-C-T-I-N, colproctin. And there are figures for this. It is indication of a protein in the white blood cell, and mainly the white blood cell is the neutrophil. A neutrophil is the first line of defense in the body, in the innate. I-N-N-A-T-E, the immune system which we are born with, and it is very old system. It evolved over billions of years. So fecal caliproctin in milli microgram per gram, if it is less than 100, it is normal. 100 to 250, it is intermediate. If it is more than 250, microgram per gram, it is high, and it means that there is IBD. If this protein is less than 50 microgram per gram, it is negative. So I repeat, 100 is normal. More than 250 is high, it means inflammation. We could measure also the ferritin, which is the stored iron in the body. And a transferrin, trans mean transport, ferrin mean iron. The protein which transport the iron, also we can measure it. And we could do vitamin B12, as we said, folic acid, which is vitamin B9, vitamin D. We could do so many tests. For example, if we want to use a drug, for treatment. 
we could do an enzyme to see if this enzyme is high or low. If it is low, then we will give low dosage. Because if there is no enzyme to deal with this drug, then we should give low dose. Because if we give high dose, we will have side effect. And the name of this enzyme is TRMT, thiopurine methyl transferase. Always ASE, it means enzyme. So we check this enzyme before we give this drug or this tablet or this medicine. And also we could do a screening test for infection if the patient has uh, hepatitis A, if hepatitis B, hepatitis C, tuberculosis. All these things is important or HIV to see before treating the patient because we should treat this infection before we commit ourselves. So it is very important to check the patient before treatment. So this is the diagnosis. Another one is the endoscopy. Endoscopy, we look directly at the inside of the digestive tract using the endoscope. Endoscope is a long, thin, flexible tube with camera in its tip and of course the flashlight to examine the digestive system. But now there is advanced type of endoscopy which help in the diagnosis and they have different names. It depends which part of the gut you are examining. If you examine the upper part of the GI tract, so there is an, an, a special endoscope. If you examine the colon, it is called colonoscope and the procedure is colonoscopy, PY at the end. If you want to examine the sigmoid, it is called sigmoidoscopy and you use the sigmoid. If you want to check the rectum only, it is called the proctoscope. So it depends where you want to examine which area of the colon. During endoscopy, we take a small tissue sample for examination. And we send it to a doctor to examine it under the microscope. And this doctor is called pathologist. Patho means disease. Logist means a doctor who look after the disease. Some, we give them capsule endoscopy, they swallow it. It is tiny camera about the size of a grape. And this will take photos of the inside of the gut. And these photos are transmitted to a data recorder. And this data recorder, the patient wear it around the waist. And he go to his work for eight hours, come back to the hospital. They take from him this recorder and then they study the photograph of the gut. It is disposable. And it will pass naturally in the bowel movement. So this is a mean of the diagnosis. X-rays also. Sometimes in emergency, we could do plain abdominal X-ray. We do CT scan. And this will make serial images of the gut in two dimensions. But sometimes we have to do x-rays. We give barium. Barium is a material, whitish material like yogurt, given orally in the mouth or by enema. Why? Because barium is not absorbed. So, it will form a temporary coating to the inside of the gut so that it will give a clear outline of the inside of the gut and we could see inflammation, polyps, carcinoma. So the barium is used. Either we give it, we drink it or we pass it in the anus as enema. Another mean of investigation, it is MRI scan. And mostly we use it in children because we want to avoid the children exposed to x-rays because these children, they will need x-rays and investigation all their lives. So we have to do this because less exposure to radiation. 
because if we expose the children to X-ray radiation, then they will have carcinoma. And we don't want to do this, especially in their cases, because their immune system is weak. Also, there is ultrasound discount, inflammation, and thickened bowel wall, and there is collection of a fluid. We could see abscess, we could see fistula. So, this is the x-rays. And then I will, before I go to the, in the blood test, I mentioned we check for screening for infection like uh, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, HIV, varicella, zoster virus, TB, especially before we start immunosuppressant, because immunosuppressant, it will suppress the immune system. And if we give them these drugs, then it is very, the patient will become more sick. We could also measure the antibodies if we want to give them biologic and biologic are synthetic protein antibodies because we have to check the blood of the patient before we give them this drug so that because some patients they develop immune response to biologics and they become less effective they don't work we could do the drug level also of the patient is on treatment and uh, we do the elements For example, zinc, selenium, chromium, calcium, phosphate, magnesium, all the trace elements we have to check the patient because these patients, they are in poor nutrition, especially the Crohn disease because the small intestine is involved and the small intestine is the site for digestion and absorption of food. The patient with ulcerative colitis, they are better in nutrition because the job of the colon is only to digest complex carbohydrate and absorption of water and salt. And to receive the food which is not digested, uh, digest the fibers and the complex carbohydrate and then push the stool toward the rectum for evacuation. So ulcerative colitis, they are better in nutrition than Crohn. Crohn, they are more sick. So this uh, IBD, we have to have differential diagnosis from other disease, for example, celiac disease. So we have to do blood tests to check the antibodies for celiac. And we mentioned this in the audio film, which are three antibodies. We have to do the other differential diagnosis is carcinoma of the colon. Because these patients also, they pass blood in the stool but it is called occult blood loss. Occult mean masked, mean not shown. Unless we examine it, we can see it, occult. It's not active bleeding. It is called fecal occult blood. And as an acronym is FOB. F from fecal, O from occult, B from blood. Acronym, by the way, it means ACR, mean summit, tip. NEM mean name. So acronym is creation of a new word from the first three big words. So instead of saying fecal occult blood, we say FOB, F-O-B. And this is different from abbreviation. Abbreviation means the word we make it shorter. For example, doctor. Instead of writing doctor, we say DR. Or prof instead of professor. And it is used in many branches of life. Then now the differential diagnosis, celiac disease, carcinoma of the colon, irritable bowel syndrome. In fact, 20% of the cases of IBD, they have irritable bowel syndrome. Also food allergy, food intolerance, intestinal infection, especially C. difficile, which is these patients, they have a recurrent or many times they give them antibiotic and then they develop this infection with the Clostridium difficile. And the treatment nowadays is fecal microbial transplant. Now it is the standard treatment because the patient, they 
respond 92% of the cases. And the response to the antibiotic vancomycin is uh, 30%. So now it is approved by the FDA as a treatment, fecal transplant. The stool from a robust, healthy patient, which is called super donor, it's given to the patient with C. difficile because it is fatal. If you don't treat them, they die. And this C. difficile, it is called antibiotic associated colitis. It is due to giving antibiotic many courses. So the patient developed this inflammation of the colon. Colitis means inflammation of the colon. Also, infection of the colon, like with salmonellosis, typhoid fever, intestinal functional diarrhea of the gastrointestinal tract, infection, for example, intestinal tuberculosis, amoebiasis, meaning dysentery, chronic Yersinia infection. So, these are the differential diagnoses. Of course, in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, in 10% of the cases, we cannot differentiate between them. We cannot. So now, the standard diagnostic approach, the clinical features, biomarkers of inflammation like radiology, endoscopy, but this standard diagnostic approaches, they give only marginal feature, very little. Till now, we don't know the cause, we don't know what happened, we don't know what is the best treatment. It's not enough. And it's not enough to decide which treatment we give the patient. And also in our surgical approach. And in a prognosis, what we tell the patient. Till now, we are we are not clear on these points. But now there is recent advances in endoscopic imaging technique and biomarkers, molecular pathology, meaning studying the molecule, studying the small little things at the level of quantum biology. This is what I think. Genetic, studying epigenetic, metabolomic, meaning the metabolism of the microbiome. You see, microbiome is an aggregate of the genome of the microorganism in the gut. So to remember, om, biome, and genome. Microbiota is the specific microorganisms in the gut. But we use both them, and we use it. The same, we use it, but they are different. So now the recent advances is in endoscopy imaging and technique, in molecular pathology, in genetic, epigenetic, metabolomic, and proteomic. Proteomic means studying the proteins. You see the protein, it is the main tool the body uses to make its function. It is everywhere, the protein in the structure of the body, in the repair, in the antibodies, in the fight against infection, in all cell function, it is the protein. It is very, very important to understand the protein. And it is different uh, function, amazing, the protein, it is the main thing in the function of the cell, the protein. And still, all this, we are still, we don't know the cause, we don't know the treatment. And uh, 5 to 15 percent of cases we said they are any classified, IBD any classified. And 4 percent of the classified, they change over time. Okay, what is the size of this problem? Why do we care? What's the problem? We do care because it is increasing all over the world and especially in the westernized countries, industrial countries, and in the cities. In USA, there are three millions in inflammatory bowel disease, both 
ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And the prevalence is 1.3%. 1.3%. In 1999, the prevalence was 0.9%. And there were only 2 million IBD. But now, in 2015, we have 3 million IBD and 1.3% the prevalence. And they follow them up for 40 years, and 30% of them, they end up with colectomy, meaning removal of the colon. 1% of Crohn's disease, they will have a small intestinal carcinoma. And 10% of IBD, they will have carcinoma of the colon. This is the problem in the United States. In Canada, in 2018, they have 270,000 cases of IBD. 120,000, they have ulcerative colitis. 135,000, they have a Crohn's disease. And 15,000, they have IBD and classified. So the incidence is, in Canada, in 2018 is 0.7% or 7 cases per 1,000 of the population. Now, in children less than 18 years old, and as I said, they have 5 years old, 2 years old patient, and this of course will affect their schooling, their career, their psychology, their training in life, everything. So, in 2008, there are 68 in 100,000. Okay. In 2018, 10 years, there is an increase 53%, meaning the number become 101. From 68, they become 101. And always, it is measured in 100,000 of population. This is the this is the rule. This is the system. In 2030, they expect to have three times the number in these children below the age of 18 years old, and it will become 172 per 100,000. Three times from 2008. In 2030, they expect in Canada to have 400,000 cases of IBD. So now they have 270,000. They will become 400,000. And the incidence now in 2018 is 0.7%. It will become 1%. 1%. It increase. And two-thirds of the cases are less than 30 years old. In Canada... The highest number is in Nova Scotia, but the lowest is in British Columbia. The highest number of IBD is in Ashkenazi Jews, the European Jews, and in South Asian descendant, the highest in this. In Ashkenazi Jews, it is about five times to eight times more than other population. And it is lowest in the East Asian descendant. East Asia includes China, Hong Kong, Japan, these areas. It is East Asia. But they are living in Canada, and I think they are immigrant. That's why they said descendant. But East Asia, it includes China, Japan, Hong Kong. So, so the problem is big. And the incidence in the westernized, industrialized countries is more than the developing countries. And as we said, in the cities, it is more than in the countryside. If we look to Europe, the incidence is 4.9 to, or the prevalence, 4.9 
to 505, 505 per 100,000. This is in Europe. In Asia and Middle East, 4.9 to 168.3 per 100,000. In USA, is 37.5 to 248.6 per 100,000. And this is all ulcerative colitis, not IBD. These figures are ulcerative colitis. If the figure for Crohn in Europe is 0.6, to 322 per 100,000. In Asia and Middle East, it is 0.88 to 67.9, which is low in Asia and Middle East. And in USA, the Crohn disease is 16.7 to 318.7 per 100,000. Any classified IBD is a 3 to 7 per 100,000, and the new cases is 5 to 15 percent. So the problem is it will become more and it is epidemic all over the world because of the change in the environment and change in the lifestyle. So the treatment, the principle of treatment is anti-inflammatory treatment because it is inflammation, anti mean against inflammation, so there is a drug which is called 5-ASA. It is salicylate. It is relative to aspirin. It is not absorbed, but it dissolves inside the colon. And it is used in mild to moderate IBD. And it is amino salicylate. But as an acronym, we said ASS. A from amino S from salicylate and it is recommended as first line of treatment and also for maintenance because it has less side effects. But there is interesting thing that patient with ulcerative colitis they were given in addition to this drug they were given curcumin in large dose which is 1.5 gram twice daily and the response was very good. It is very significantly better than giving 5 ASA alone. So curcumin proved to be effective in these cases of ulcerative colitis. And this drug, as I said, it worked against inflammation. It tamed the inflammation. It cooled it down. It cooled it down. Number two, we use a steroid, either as oral, prednisolone or in the eye intravenous drip but usually the steroid we have to be careful because we cannot give it for a long period of time because the effect the side effect is very serious we could use it for a short time to control the flare-up but if there is no response say within three days we have to stop we cannot give it for a long time the third approach in treatment is antibiotic and this indirect effect on the inflammation. But some people are against this because it will affect the microbiome and they call it machine. It's just like shooting yourself with a gun. But some people, they use it. And also the fourth tab is immunomodulators. Immunomodulators, they uh, help the immune system and uh, there are drugs special for Crohn disease, for example, methotrexate, and a special drug for ulcerative colitis, which is called cyclosporine. These are approved by the FDA specifically for these diseases. Most of the drugs are approved for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn disease, but only a few drugs are specific 
either for ulcerative colitis and another drug only for Crohn's disease. And the other group of drug is called biologic. They are synthetic. And they are called biologic agent or therapies, treatment, agent or therapies, treatment. They are used in moderate to severe cases which are not responsive to the conventional therapy, to the standard therapy with the salicylate, with the amino salicylate or with the steroids. And the biologic are proteins. They block the inflammation. And they usually, the first one which is discovered, they work against TNF. TNF alpha, T mean a tumor necrosis factor. This is a chemical which is secreted by uh, the T, by the, sometimes by the natural killer cells in the immune system or by CD8. And so this biologic, it acts against this factor which the body uses it to kill the bacteria. This is very strong. It's very toxic. If you put it in the lab with a tumor cell, it will dissolve the tumor cells. It is called tumor necrosis factor alpha. But now they have another types of biologic. It also works against these chemicals, which the body uses in its defense against inflammation and against invader. But in this case, IBD, the body is attacking itself. It attacks the mucosa. And then when the inflammation is so strong, it will go through the mucosa as leaky gut, and then it will attack the body. So the new biologic are anti-integrin agent. Integrin is also a chemical produced by the immune system and by the cells. And anti-interleukin. Inter means between. Leukin means between two white blood cells. Leuco in Latin means white. And interleukin 12 and 23. IgG1 kappa agent. Now it is becoming complicated. So forget the names. It is also interleukin 12 and 23. You see, in the body, I mean, they discover 35 interleukins. And they are all numbers. From interleukin 1 up to interleukin 35. And each one, it has specific function. But... Now they call them cytokine. Cyto means cell, kin means act on the tissue. And now we have 50, or some people think 54 cytokine. So the principle of treatment is to give amino salicylate first, number one. Two is a steroid. Three, immunomodulators. And number four is biologic. This is medical treatment. And of course, there is surgical treatment. In surgical treatment, it depends on what lesion is affected, and then the surgery will be planned accordingly. But if all the colon is affected, and for a long time, then sometimes they do total colectomy. They remove all the colon, and some, they do ileostomy, meaning they bring the stool, no, they bring the ileum to the skin, and then the stool will be collected in a bag. And this could be temporary ileostomy. After eight months, one year, then we bring this ileum and connect it to the rectum, if it is still healthy, or to the anus, to keep the continence of the patient. Sometimes we have to leave permanent ileostomy, and the patient, they have to spend all their life emptying the bags. That's it. And sometimes we do ileal pouch, to create like rectum, and we suture it to the anal canal. And there is a study in ulcerative colitis. 50% of these patients with the pouch, they will develop pouchitis. The pouch means inflammation of the pouch. 
and the same microorganism like in the colon and the epithelial changes in these pouches they will become like the colon and this mean this indicate why ulcerative colitis it happen only in the colon or in the large intestine so in this case in ulcerative colitis we bring ileal pouch which is a small intestine and suture it and the small intestine it change into large intestine and this is very interesting study they do sample from time zero to study the pouch then every four months up to two years follow up and this is a very good study because the patient they are their own control why because they did biopsy from the pouch and from above the pouch <clears throat> And also, this is the control. The patient themselves, they are controlled. And also, they compare them with patients who have pouch operation, who have familial adenomatous polyposis. Some families, they have polyps in the large intestine. And these polyps, they look like a tumor, which is called adenoma. So, they are called... F A P familial adenomatous polyposis. Now, other type of treatment in the pipeline is the fecal transplant, and there are many interesting attempt and clinical trials. And one study, they give uh, large dose as an enema, like slurry. They mix the stool from a super healthy person and mix it with saline, and they give it as enema. Then they give capsule daily for one month. And there is a response in ulcerative colitis in 10 to 15% of cases. But some studies, they claim 40% improvement with fecal transplant. And this is very interesting. But of course, we have to take care how to prepare the colon. Uh, we have to be careful about the donor because these patients, they have inflamed bowel and they could have side effects. They could have infection. It takes a lot of care and a lot of studies. But there is a lot of studies in this line. Of course, the treatment to start with it should be lifestyle modification. Everything, all the package. Sleep, relaxation, exercise daily, dealing with stress, diet modification. Because diet, it is the main environmental factor to change the microbiome. So the diet, no gluten, no dairy, no milk, no products, no sugars. Because they found the sugar, it increased the IBD, it's toxic. And now, there is a university created a friendly carbohydrate-specific diet, and they give the patient this diet for six weeks. They provide it for them, and the patient will do it for themselves for another six weeks. And this is for Crohn's disease. And they compare it with Mediterranean diet. The diet, there should be no artificial sweeteners, because they find artificial, artificial sweeteners, they increase C. difficile, it is toxic. No emulsifier, like xanthine gum, carnigine, carginine, 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 yes. It used as emulsifiers and as thickeners. They are not good, we should not take them. And... Food map also, low food map, which I uh, describe in the other videos, and whole plant diet or vegan. So there is a trial now, vegan diet versus, again, specific carbohydrate diet. No soya, no corn, no eggs, no peanut, no grains, no beans. No red meat. Why? Because red meat, it has sulfur. And sulfur, it will increase hydrogen sulfide in the colon. 
and hydrogen sulfide H2S. If it increase in amount, it will become toxic to the mitochondria and to the mucine barrier of the colon. Okay, about omega-3, it is anti-inflammatory. Vegetable oil, it is rich in omega-6. It is an inflammatory oil. The ratio of omega-3 should be 1 to omega-6, 1. So the ratio should be 1 to 1 or 1 to 2, 1 omega-3 and 2 omega-6. But now in the West, if we examine the blood of the patient, it is 1 omega-3, 16 to 20 omega-6. So the diet in IBD, it is not one diet for every patient. It should be personal. Every patient, there should be a special diet for that patient. And the treatment to target, it means we have to achieve mucosal healing. And also, the interesting thing now, they try to do group therapy. The patient come with a group of patients. And there is a group of doctors also, or personnel, medical personnel, social worker, psychiatrist, nutritionist, person who is specialized in food, uh, physician, physiotherapy, stress management, and they find the result is very good. Their aim was to reduce the rate of admission by 15%, hospital admission, but they achieved reduction 60 percent reduction in hospital admission and also reduction in the visit to the emergency department and they find this is very cost effective it is cheaper for the patient because in the group the patient can talk to each other they can support each other they can There is a special thing in a group. There is a group dynamic, irrespective of the content. And this is very well recognized in medicine. And in, you know, because loneliness, it is part of the causes of the disease and the causation of the disease. Because these patients, they spend long times in the toilet with a bleeding per rectum, diarrhea, pain, tinnitus, and they feel very lonely. I'm very depressed. I'm very unhappy. But when they come in the group and they see patients like them and they carry on with life, they feel better. And they start to cope with life. So social support is very important. And also diet rich in polyphenols, the chemical which is antioxidant, like fruit, vegetables. Also, there are trials now and a study of a prebiotic fibers. Probiotic, pro mean good organism, good bacteria. And mainly, you have to avoid fried food and fat because fat, it is very bad in these IBDs. And there is Japanese studies about that and in Canada also. So we have to avoid <clears throat> French fries, fried potatoes, because it is toxic. And there is now a new zebra fish model to study colitis or inflammation of the colon <clears throat> at five days old because it is a transparent and see through so they give the toxin to this fish and they could see through the skin because the skin we can see through it we don't need to kill the fish and we could see the changes in the colon when we give them these toxins in the United States of America, they have made and produced 80,000 chemicals. And in USA, in their blood, each one of them, 
they have 10,000 chemicals, but they don't know. And this is from Dr. Mark Hyman, who is the director of functional medicine in Cleveland Clinic. He said, 88% of the American are metabolically unhealthy. Of course, this is in regard to COVID-19. But it is the same. The same. Because it is the environment. It is the lifestyle. It is the same. And 1.2 pre-diabetic and diabetic. 75% are obese. And these obese people, they are likely to die three times more than normal weight people. And 42% are obese. This is an American doctor about one week ago, and it is very fresh and very recent. So, in the treatment of uh, IBD, we need personal approach. We could use the standard traditional approach for those who doesn't want to change their lifestyle or their diet, because some people, they don't. So we give them the standard traditional approach. But IBD is an autoimmune disease, and it impacts not only the digestive tract, but all the body. And the inflammation has to stop because it is just like fire, burning fire. So education of the patient is very important to take control of their health and their symptoms, because even if they come and see a doctor every now and then, they will spend about three to four hours per year. But 99% of the time, almost all the year, the patient has to look after themselves. They have to look after their diet. They have to look for the frequency of how many times they pass a stool, if there is a blood in their stool. So they have to know. They have to be empowered with knowledge. They have to learn their diseases. They have to be their own doctors. And also these cases, they might need supplement like zinc, selenium, magnesium, vitamin D3, chromium, because these supplements are very important for the immune system. So now, it is very important and practical to embrace the health concept and changing towards healthy lifestyle. You see, education alone is not enough. What matter is to do is the function. It is all the package. It is all the program. And nowadays, they do a plan for the patient, special for that patient, depending on the input from that individual patient. Before, when the patient comes, they put him in a model, one, two, three, four, five. You go and take one. No, now there is no such thing. They put them in a program depending on the patient and his story and what the patient said. At the end, I would like to say there will be progress, and now there is a progress in the microbiome, and there will be a new medicine, which is called microbiome medicine. This is what I think, because it is very important, and we are still in infancy about our microbiome, and I hope one day we will have a smart toilet or a smart toilet paper so when the patient wipe themselves, they could put it on an app, and the app will read for them their health. How? By analyzing the microbiome from their stool sample. So, and I think this is science fiction. I think this will come from Japan. Why? Because 
I have seen a lot of articles and scientific studies and science about microbiome from Japan. And number two, I know their toilets is very advanced. And they are the best. And they are amazing. And they are very expensive. And they do a lot of sophisticated functions. So, to recap, IBD, it is a very difficult complex disease. It is a continuum, and some people, they think even irritable bowel syndrome is part of inflammatory bowel disorders, although the inflammation in irritable bowel syndrome is small, or it is little, or it is not as active as in IBD. But all the diseases, if you study deep, it is the gene, the environment, the microbiome, the leaky intestinal gut, and the gut microbiome brain axis. It is all the same in all chronic inflammatory diseases. All the same principles. All one. So, and the treatment is changing lifestyle, changing the diet. And I hope the environment will change too. Thank you.